transfer radioactive water in the tank to an adjacent tank. The utility says the leaked water has not flowed into the ocean because there is no ditch around the tank and the sea is some 800 meters away. TEPCO says it will take at least five days to finish the transfer of water. The operator of the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is being forced to review the way it manages contaminated water. This follows the discovery of a second leak in its water storage system. Tokyo Electric Power Company said on Sunday that it has found a small leakage, up to three liters, from an underground storage facility. The tank currently contains about 10,000 tons of radioactive water. The firm now plans to transfer about 2,000 tons of radioactive water from the tank. It says the leakage may be coming from upper part of the tank. This follows an earlier massive leak of about 120 tons of radioactive water from another underground tank. The power company is in the process of transferring 13,000 tons of radioactive water to two different tanks. TEPCO also says it will closely monitor the situation by taking water samples twice a day from 24 locations. The city of Fukushima now has Japan's first facility for reducing the volume of the radioactive sludge from the 2011 nuclear disaster. The facility was installed by the Environment Ministry in a municipal sewage treatment plant. The ceremony was held in a city on Saturday. The facility will dry the sludge at a temperature of 450 degrees Celsius and reduce it to about one-fifth of its original volume. The Environment Ministry expects the facility to treat 30 tons of sludge daily. Such sludge has been accumulating in sewage treatment plants in Fukushima and neighboring prefectures due to a lack of progress in the building of interim storage facilities. The volume of such sludge in Fukushima prefecture alone has risen to more than 68,000 tons. <laughs> We have to make many tough decisions when we have a radiation disaster, and that's what we've been doing to move things forward. I think building this facility is one step in that direction. The ministry plans to transfer the dried and shrunken sludge to interim storage facilities and permanent disposal sites, although it is unclear when these facilities will be built. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says his government will do all it can to help rebuild areas devastated by the earthquake and tsunami that hit northeastern Japan two years ago. Abe visited the stricken areas on Saturday. It was his fifth such visit since taking office in December. More than 180 people died in Miyako City in Iwate Prefecture. The city had boasted one of the largest breakwaters in the country. At 10 meters high and over 2 kilometers long, but the tsunami surged beyond it. Standing on the breakwater, the Prime Minister offered a silent prayer for the victims. The city mayor briefed Abe on plans to build a higher breakwater and to begin work in September to develop land to move residents to higher ground. We'll make an all-out effort to rebuild homes and towns, including group relocations of residents. Abe also visited other towns in Iwate Prefecture on Saturday to see how the affected people are faring two years after the disaster. Japanese government officials are preparing for a possible missile launch by North Korea. The South Korean government has warned of a launch possibly later this week. The Japanese are trying to gather more information and are taking every precaution. 
Defense Minister Itsunori Ono Dera issued an order to the self-defense forces to destroy any debris that might fall on Japanese territory. The self-defense forces will deploy an Aegis destroyer in the Sea of Japan. It's equipped with an advanced radar system that can track missiles, and it carries SM-3 interceptor missiles. The North Koreans tested a rocket in December. They said they put a satellite into orbit, but diplomats in several countries say they were testing missile technology. Now, defense officials in that drifted to the U.S. West Coast from a tsunami hit Japanese port two years ago. It's now on public display at an aquarium in the state of Oregon. The 10 centimeter striped Beak fish was found swimming in a box in the 5.5 meter long fishing boat that washed ashore in Washington state last month. It was later taken to the aquarium in Oregon. This type of fish can be found in its natural habitat in waters around Japan and the East China Sea. Actually, people are pretty fascinated about seeing this fish and the, the fact that it came all the way over from Japan in the debris. The boat's owner is a resident of northeastern Japan. He says the empty boat had been taken ashore at the time of the disaster. He speculates that the fish probably found shelter in the boat as it drifted toward the U.S. Rising tension on the Korean peninsula may lead to the evacuation of embassies and international groups in the north's capital, Pyongyang. North Korean foreign ministry officials on Friday called on foreign entities to be prepared to evacuate. Countries with embassy staff include Russia and Britain. A British Foreign Office spokesperson said they were told that if war breaks out, North Korea can't guarantee the safety of diplomats and representatives of international organizations from April 10th. He said staff would not be immediately evacuated while discussions are held with the representatives of other countries. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said he is studying the North's notification. The proposal was made to all embassies in Pyongyang, and we are now trying to clarify the situation. He says Russia is closely discussing the matter with the member countries of the six-party talks on North Korea's nuclear... Live, this is one for the record. I'm Diana, and today is April 9th, 2013. And here are your updates for today. Let's see here. The Watchers Watching the World. Fukushima leaking ac radioactivity water, serious problems with spent fuel pools, destructive and deadly earthquake magnitude 6.3 struck southern Iran. Okay, that's it for that one. Also today, the Extinction Protocol 2012 and beyond. Whale struggles through epidemic of measles, deadly H7N9 virus claims eighth victim in China. Shallow 6.3 magnitude earthquake strikes southern Iran near nuclear plant four dead. North Korea tells foreigners in South to take safety measures. Alrighty then, moving on. The E and E News, Energy News, Fukushima, Japan, TEPCO, losing faith in leaking Fukushima tanks, but we don't have anywhere else to put the radioactive water. Also, Tremendous worry. Emergency operation halted at Fukushima plant. Contaminated water from leaking tank put into another leaking tank. Also, Asashi. All radioactive water storage tanks at Fukushima Daiichi leaking. We are giving priority to the number two tank where conditions are worse. Alrighty then, let's go to U.S. Canada. Obviously, I'm not home. <laughs> Alrighty then, yesterday I put the tip jar on, not today, so, because I'm going to attach things. Today, legal experts, giant sinkhole now roughly as big as the Superdome. A humanitarian crisis in the center of Louisiana. 
Also, former top U.S. nuclear official, U.S. nuclear plant would be phased out. Can't guarantee against accident causing widespread land contamination. All right, and that was yesterday's. All righty then. All righty. So, it is two days down. It's Tuesday evening, three to go before the weekend. Have a wonderful, wonderful, safe evening. I'll see you tomorrow on the flip side. Please be prepared for anything. Stay tuned. I'm going to attach some videos. Take care. I got your backs. Even if it's from broadcasting from some restaurant somewhere. Ever wonder what might lie out there deep in space? Do you want to believe we're not alone, that somewhere in the universe, intelligent life may actually exist? Our next guest says there is life out there. It does exist. Dr. Charles Halls says he spent two years working with extraterrestrial beings during his time with the American military. He claims the US military has actually been in contact with alien species for years. And Dr. Charles Hall is here to explain, along with his wife Marie, live from what Bugs Bunny used to call Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now, thank you both for your time. Terrific to have you with us. Firstly, Charles, can you tell us your story of how you managed to come into contact with these beings as you worked with the military? I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I enlisted in the Air Force in July 1964, and I was trained as a weather observer, and, and I was sent to Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada, outside Las Vegas, Nevada, and I, for two and a half years I was sent up to the gunnery ranges up at Indian Springs and I was given a clearance to allow me to go anywhere anywhere in dreamland uh, as long as I was alone. I discovered that up there at the north end of Indian Springs Valley, which you can see on the map in the state of Nevada here in America, that there was a base which the U.S. Air Force maintained mm -hmm. for a group of extraterrestrials who were tall and white. And I, as the duty weather observer, was allowed to go up there, or they were allowed to come down to where I was. And that the interaction took place over more than two years. Wow. During those two years, I also came across, I, I also interacted to a lesser extent with the Roswell Grays, and I've also personally talked with the extraterrestrials that I call the Norwegians with 24 teeth, who come here from a very nearby star, perhaps Bernard's star. And um, my experiences, my presentations, my books are unique mm -hmm. because um, I'm the only person that I know that I know of that was allowed to interact with the extraterrestrials, with the tall whites, for more than two years. So three different species of, of aliens you're talking about there, Charles. Yeah, can you describe what they looked yes, like, what, what they were like? Well, I'll, I'll start with the tall whites. They're <coughs> thinner than we are, and they're very frail. Throughout most of their life, they are the same height as I am, 5'11", but they, and they live 10 times longer than humans. They live 600 or 800 years. Wow. And, but they don't age the way we do. When they, when they get to be equivalent to a human of about 40 years, that means when they are about 400 years, they start growing again instead of aging as humans. Right. And then they go, and this continues. And so that by the time they get to be 600 or 800 years old, they're very tall, eight and a half, nine, or ten feet tall, but this is not necessarily good because their skeleton grows more than their internal organs. Ah. And so there comes a time after six or eight hundred years when their skeleton, their body is tall, but their organs can't support can't it, support the at origin. which time they mm. die a natural death, because they're just flesh and blood creatures like we are. If they injure themselves, it takes them 
ten times longer to heal up than a human. Yeah. So there's a trade-off. Yeah, right. They still look fresh as a daisy when they go, though. They mm -hmm. look like Tilda Swinton. Mm -hmm. Hey, yeah, just quickly, you, you, you had them there. You were working with the aliens um, for on, on any particular project, or was the military working with the aliens on a particular project? Was there, I don't know, technology mm -hmm. sharing or, you know, mm -hmm. botanical cross-fertilization? The, um, the U.S. Air Force, and I'm speaking of the mid-1960s, was willing to give them anything they asked for. When I first met them, I was very afraid of them, and every human I met when you come across them out in the desert was naturally very afraid of them, and they were even more afraid of us. It's like running into a gorilla in the wild yeah. where the gorilla is on his home ground. So yeah. they had to go through a process of becoming used to being around humans before they could take part in the technology transfer program. I, as the weather observer, was the to test human. I, as an enlisted man, I was expendable. You know, sure. I was yeah. the one they send out to the yeah. yeah. talk exactly. to Charlie. And Marie, let's bring you in. You've never yeah. seen these things for yourself. Are you a believer? Because probably a lot of people watching this this morning are going to think, I don't believe him. It's ridiculous. How could it be possible? Uh, well, Charles was very intelligent in that he waited until we'd been married a couple of months before he told me about <laughs> the extraterrestrials coming into his barracks at night. And uh, he said, well, what do you think? And I said, I really don't care. I have never given any thought as to whether they uh, exist or not, and I really don't care. I've known Charles. We, we've been married over 43 years. Uh, he may be a character, but I am his character reference, <laughs> and uh, I, I, totally <laughs> I totally believe uh, that this is real. Furthermore, we have had uh, confirmations from people all over the world. We have never had any serious uh, tire kickers, you yeah, know, people yeah. who say, well... Well, certainly there seems to be a lot of people, it would seem to be a lot of people around the world who would support your view on this, who seem to have had their own experiences, but probably not quite as intimately as you. Now, unfortunately, we are going to have to leave it there, Charles and Marie, because we're about to lose our satellite, but you're coming to Australia next week to give a series of, uh, of talks, and we, we can't can wait to see wait. you, yeah. and all the details of your... Alrighty, so this was from History UFO, that channel... History UFO, all one word, and the name of it is 2013 Testimony Military UFO Contact with Aliens Dash Physicist Dr. Hall. Alrighty then. I never saw it. I bet you most, there's only 1,235 views, so most of us had, has not seen that, so... So it was posted in March 2013, I believe. Alrighty then, I thought this was very interesting disclosure for you guys. From the City of Angels off the Pacific Ocean, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be, across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie and welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Emerging artist tonight and next hour, creating your own miracles. Here's what's happening. China has warned against troublemaking on its doorstep in an apparent rebuke to North Korea. The North, led by the 30-year-old Kim Jong-un, has been issuing threats, as you know, of war against the United States and the U.S.-backed South Korea since the United Nations imposed sanctions in response to its third nuclear weapons test a few months ago. North Korean officials told diplomats late last week to consider leaving North Korea because of the tension, but embassies appear to view the appeal as more rhetoric, and so far staff, they've stayed put. China, North Korea's sole financial diplomatic backer, has shown growing irritation with North Korea's warnings of war. And a top South Korean national security official said that North Korea may be setting the stage for a missile test or other provocative act with its warning that it soon will be unable to guarantee diplomat safety. But he added that the North's clearest objective is to extract concessions from Washington and South Korea. 
Brian Morrow, of course, is a national security analyst for ClarionProject.org, and he's on with us right now. Brian, uh, over the past couple weeks, have you seen a change here with North Korea, or is it continuing to uh, spout the rhetoric? It's continuing, but the rhetoric continues to go upwards and, and become worse and worse. And so it looks like Kim Jong-un is trying to outdo his father, not just in the volume of the threats, but also in making good on those threats. And that's why all the speculation right now about North Korea just carrying out a nuclear test uh, this week is something I don't believe, because they've done that before. The, the rhetoric doesn't match that action. It looks like the United States is trying to pull back a little bit. What do you hear? Uh, that is, because we're worried that, well, it's basically a prize backer. We're worried that if we respond to their provocation, then they have to respond to even louder, and then it just goes back and forth. And there's a very dangerous balancing act where you have to give them some type of reaction, otherwise they're going to just keep doing things until they get a reaction. But then when you finally do react, you have to be careful not to ratchet up the tension as a result. And so it's a very delicate balancing act. Um, and it, as I said last time I was on your program, there is bound to be a miscalculation here by the North Korean regime at some point. Yeah, there's going to be a mistake. And if there is a mistake, Ryan, then what happens? <laughs> well, the potential is for all hell to break loose uh, between North Korea and South Korea. Um, a lot of the concern right now is about North Korea's cyber capabilities. According to some reports, they have up to 30,000 hackers as a part of their cyber warfare uh, force and it rivals the capacity of the CIA. So this isn't just some hackers hanging out in their parents' basement. Uh, we're talking about a real cyber warfare force here. Okay, what's new with ClarionProject.org? Uh, well, we're just keeping track on radical Islamic-related uh, activities in the Middle East, uh, especially here in the United States. Uh, so you can go there and learn about what the Muslim Brotherhood, the Iranian regime, and what the other guys are up to here. All right, Brian, thanks. Appreciate you being on the program, always. Radiation from Japan's Fukushima disaster is being looked at now as one possible cause for what some experts are declaring as unusual mortality events after hundreds of ailing sea lion pups washed ashore in Southern California. If this is true, this is not good news. That means the radiation is spreading from that Fukushima plant disaster which occurred almost two years ago. China has reported two more cases of human infection of a new strain of bird flu, raising the number of cases in eastern China to 20 now, and the death toll among those contracted with the virus remains at 6. Dr. Len Horowitz, of course, international authority on emerging diseases with us. Leonard, why does it appear that these, these cases all occur in China? Well, there's a large political agenda currently unfolding in China that reflects the World Health Organization's agenda, United Nations. So you've got Rockefeller Rothschild pulling the propaganda over a flu fright, which is basically showing the whole diplomatic effort currently that the global industrialists who control the pharmaceutical cartel, the vaccinations, all the money-making off of the frights have been engaged in China heavily over the last couple of years. And coming now, what's happening is even in China, very well-respected for oriental medicine and herbs and herbal therapies and acupuncture is being increasingly regulated by the same cartel that is regulating the FDA. And, 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 Leonard, in China, where they've had now 20 cases of this new strain, I mean, 20 cases compared to the normal flu, where in this country we, we have 30,000 deaths a year plus, that's not a lot, is it? It's an outrageous fraud, is it, what it amounts to. Basically, their propaganda campaign is simply, you know, fanning fears, and they did that with SARS, they did that with the H1N1 swine flu, and now they're doing that with this. And the, again, you have to follow the money. Where's the money? The money is in the profiteering off of humanity's ignorance and suffering and frights that they've generated, false flags, that is inducing people and governments to concede to the World Health Organization, United Nations plan, ultimately one World Health Organization uh, that is currently what you're seeing and witnessing is the manner in which the Rockefeller-directed international disease surveillance outposts were established years ago, and they're currently doing that, again, because every industry, whether it's energy, whether it's military, or whether it's pharmaceuticals, is got to be controlled in a new world order, and that's precisely what they're doing for also the benefit of preparing the populations for the 
the emergence of these laboratory creations. They're mutations that they created, and every once in a while they allow to get out because they're making a lot of money off of the flights and the campaigns. And, and like you said, George, the death rate is outrageously small for them to be spanning these levels of propaganda at this stage of the game. Exactly. Leonard, thank you so much. Leonard's website, part of our Twitter feed at coasttocoastam.com. And Twitter posts with anti-vaccine sentiments are contagious, while the posts with positive take on vaccines are not, according to a new study. The study analyzed more than 300,000 tweets that expressed an opinion about the H1N1 flu vaccine back in 2009. Twitter users who saw anti-vaccine posts in their Twitter feed tended to tweet anti-vaccine sentiments themselves, the results show. However, those who saw positive vaccine sentiments didn't tweet positive sentiments themselves. Nepal's Women's Commission has condemned an attack in the remote west part of the country on an elderly woman accused of witchcraft. The 60-year-old woman was stripped naked, had her head shaved, and was badly beaten. The woman was reportedly accused of using witchcraft to cause death and misfortune. The assault was apparently sanctioned by the village council. Last year, villages burned alive a 40-year-old woman after claiming she was a witch. The cicadas, the big noisy bugs that climb out over the earth, all over the place almost every decade and a half, experts say that this year could be a huge one. Now, they're largely harmless, but the sheer numbers, and they hatch like every 17 years, can cause all kinds of problems when they fall out of the trees, they die, and everything else. But unbelievable, the... Uh, Cicadas are just, you know, big bugs, too. They're almost like two inches long. You know, the ACLU was established in 1920. It was supposed to protect American rights, the American Civil Liberties Union. But is it doing that? Up next, Dr. Jerome Corsi joins us. We're going to talk about his latest work, Bad Samaritans, next on Coast to Coast Day Out. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie. Noted author Jerry Corsi received his Ph.D. from Harvard University in political science. He also writes for World Net Daily, and his websites are linked up at coasttocoastam.com. His latest work is out called Bad Samaritans. We're going to be talking about the ACLU this hour. It's a little different because this is an organization that was supposed to have been established back in 1920 to protect the Constitution, to protect your rights. But as Jerry Corsi points out in his books, Bad Samaritans, that's not the case anymore. Jerry, what happened? How'd they change? Well, George, the, the roots of the ACLU were uh, really a roots in, in radical communism. They were be begun by a group of people who were protesting World War I and were uh, the founder, Roger Baldwin himself, was a World War I draft resistor. And including on the board of, of directors were people like uh, William Foster, who wrote a book in 1932 towards Soviet America. Uh, the whole idea was that the ACLU was um, originally constituted to bring in socialism, communism. That's by the founders. And the point of my book, Bad Samaritans, is that it has resulted in a war on God, a determination to remove God from all aspects of American society, which ends up being a complete perversion of the First Amendment. On the face of it, the American Civil Liberties Union sounds like they're out to protect us, doesn't it? Of course it does, and I think that's really one of the main aspects of the fundraising. It's an organization that raises millions of dollars, and Americans just uh, kind of a knee-jerk reaction. American Civil Liberties Union, you think, well, this is a group that's going to protect my civil liberties. But in fact, when we look at the history of the organization, and uh, the war on God in particular, uh, the ACLU has done everything they can to reinterpret the First Amendment to so separate church and state, by the way, a phrase which does not occur in the First Amendment, uh, and to insist that we have a godless society. I mean, taking God out of the public schools, taking God out of the public square. Uh, this has been the uh, one of the major uh, efforts in the ACLU in pursuing cases going back to its foundation in the 1920s. I remember back in 1997, Jerry, uh, around the Christmas time, there was a nativity scene in a St. Louis suburb 
the government had, had put this big nativity scene up there in, in the, on the lawn in front of his building. I mean, it was for Christmas. It's been there every year for who knows how long. And the ACLU went to court to have that nativity scene taken down because they said it violated. It wasn't, a, it was, wasn't the separation of church and state. It should never have been there. And, and I, I was just baffled by that. I mean, to me, Christmas, though it is a religious holiday, it connotates how people should care about other people and be loving and giving and everything else. And that nativity scene merely represented that. And for them to want to go after it and have it ripped apart in front of, uh, you know, and taken down, I, I, I couldn't believe it. But that was, a, that was an exposure I had back in 97. And I said, there's something wrong here. Well, and, and George has continued. I mean, if you try to put a, you know, even the Ten Commandments, which is fundamental to our judicial system, try to put a, 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 some representation of the Ten Commandments in front of a courthouse, and you'll have the same objection. Uh, the, the point is that when our founding fathers wrote the First Amendment, they realized that belief in God, is, is, or the freedom to believe in God, is fundamental to the liberties that we enjoy as Americans. First Amendment does not require you to believe in God, but it does not separate church and state so that God has to be removed from the public square. Uh, just to make the point, uh, you know, when I finally called this, Thomas Jefferson and, and uh, when, when Madison and Jefferson wrote, you know, basically the concepts in the First Amendment, the idea, like Thomas Jefferson says in the Declaration of Independence, are rights are unalienable. That means they're placed into us by God. This desire to pursue God and to express faith is a natural desire in place of the, of the soul of the human being by the Creator. That was the concept. The problem is if we take God out of the equation, then our rights are conferred by the state, and the rights conferred by the state could be given, granted, or taken away. So we lose the core basis of our freedoms, as expressed in the Declaration of Independence, for instance, if we remove God from the American scene. The Pledge of Allegiance. I always remember Red Skelton uh, in, in, in his incredible rendition of the Pledge of Allegiance. But he talked about how, you know, one day he was convinced that God would be taken out of the Pledge of Allegiance. Where does that stand now in schools, Terry? Well, it still is under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. But again, this has been attacked by the ACLU. It continues to be attacked. Any reference to God in a public school is attacked. I mean, it's like, you know, you, you face penalties or dismissal as a teacher, even if you encourage a sports team in a public school to pray before they go into a competition. And a lot of this started with a series of court cases. Much of this started after World War II, you know, when Justice Black, wrote in a, in a case in uh, yeah, after World 1947, this whole taking Jefferson's phrase, a, a wall of separation between church and state, which Jefferson wrote in a letter to a Danbury, Connecticut congregation. And Justice Black decided that was written law, California law, United States federal law, NRC to enforce, by law, have to have somewhere to put the spent fuel rods. They promised us they would have the spent fuel rods taken care of by 1976, then by 1982, then by 1985, then 1991. It's 2013, you still storm on site.